the back here. This, this work um, came up originally as an agricultural contract uh, that came to our centre. Um, we have 40 million sheep, as has been observed in this meeting, and uh, good animal scientists tell us that the ideal weight for the baby, the sheep, the lamb, at birth is about 8 or 9 percent of the, of the mother's weight. Um, and uh, that, the idea being is that you want a, a feeding strategy um, that would achieve that with minimum intake of the grass, because grass is a quantity we want to spread around as much as possible. Then, um, at the beginning of last year, um, I was fortunate to um, get involved in the ICOM there, the National Research Centre for Growth and Development, which is at our one of our medical schools, and they said um, they wanted to apply these kind of models to humans because the origin of a lot of disease is in fact um, caused by the nutrition as a fetus, diabetes and obesity and so on. So the, the whole thing expanded uh, and now we are um, doing this in a, in a team. We have a, um, we have a PhD student from Thailand, uh, a colleague, Alona Bintao, and the Thai supervisor, Young Women, in Bangkok. So we've got this going uh, quite well. And uh, we've now developed algorithms that are reasonably adaptable, and I'll show you a bit about these as we go. Um, I always have to say something about the National Research Centre for Growth and Development. It's one of the cores, the centres of research excellence. Um, it's the biggest one, actually, of the seven uh, that are operating in New Zealand at the moment. And we've got, there's this mission statement um, at the bottom. And I was absolutely delighted that in its first six years, around about 2005, um, it was asked to form, it decided to form a systems biology platform. Uh, you know, here's a medical school wanting some mathematics, so off we went, and I'm now doing all this work as part of that. The partner, it crosses, co covers the whole country, government research laboratories, ag research is the agricultural interest, um, the Liggins Institute is part of the University of Auckland, us and one or two other universities as well. And it basically consumes about a third of my time uh, working on this particular project. That's what we're interested in. Um, from conception right through to birth, uh, we want a, a, a good data, of course, as Mark says, the, the models must be informed by data. Uh, it's very hard getting data early life. You're better to develop the um, the model as a, as a population of cells, about mid-term uh, you can in fact get a proxy for fetal weight by using ultrasound and there are well-known methods, most of our uh, wives uh, get, go through this and get some idea of the developing fetus. With sheep of course, the data that I'm going to show you today uh, is from sheep and um, unfortunately the way they do it is they kill them at various stages of the pregnancy and get the data by actually weighing the uh, fetus that way. But of course we don't, thank goodness, do this for humans. Um, there's the sort of candidate uh, of from where the data comes from. The, the, this sheep is actually a, an Australian, but we, we've got to, to particularly good um, sheep for, for, for New Zealand as well. Uh, there's a theory around that every New Zealander has to show a picture of a sheep. Well, I managed that. Now, the first model we started well was was based on, and the, this was informed by data, generalised logistic equation. Uh, you know, undergraduate calculus, we can all solve that, at least of our, by separation of variables, it comes out very easily. Um, and this model fits quite well, actually. Later on, I'll show you that, in fact, the K, the mythical carrying capacity, is, in fact, a function of the history of the nutrition and uh, it's certainly not constant. Of course, for a fetus, um, the second half of the fetus is all we've got. The, the second half of the pregnancy is all we've got. Should I have the microphone on, or are you hearing me okay? It's okay. Yeah, it's okay, he says. Uh, I've, my wife says I've got a loud voice. Um, <laughs> so so we, we would then ask the question, um, what's, what are 
R and, and uh, K should be. Uh, it's the specific growth rate in days, which depends on the, the net nutrient intake in kilograms per day. And that will be, in the model that I'll show you, the control. K, which might be a function of time, estimate of long-term weight of birth weight, uh, long-term birth weight, po and of course would only be achieved uh, postnatal. In fact, postnatal we also grow logistically, but of course with different R and K. Right. Uh, so we got some data, some fetal weight data. This is um, in days. The pre a typical pregnant pregnancy term for sheep is about 140 days compared to the 270 for humans. Uh, so we've got halfway through the pregnancy and, you, and that's been fitted to, uh, fitted to a logistic and we find out what R should be, 0.07 days. This is large cohorts of sheep, that's average sort of data. Um, R is 0.07 for that cohort and K is about 7 kilograms, uh, which is it's born before it gets anywhere near there and you can see the shit, this particular cohort with the, the birth was about 5,500 grams, 5,500 kilograms. Now, a um, lot of data, surprisingly good fit, look, you know, 0.98, one is perfect, um, but that's pretty good. So MATLAB unfortunately prints it out with too many decimal figures, it's not significant. So. Look at our square, excellent fit, and uh, so the simple logistic is fitting with that data rather well. So now let's pose the mathematical problem. Uh, we want to now have a, a birth weight that's fixed. So this is going to be a boundary value problem rather than an initial value problem. We'll have an initial time uh, when we start the experiment halfway through the pregnancy, say, that, and we want to um, use this equation, we want R to depend on U, the moment we'll have K is fixed, and we've got a two point boundary value problem, and what do we want to do? We want to find the smallest U that fits this. We had a lot of debates with the animal scientists as to how the specific growth rate would depend on the intake, and the best information we could get from them um, was that it was of the form Michaelis Menton. Uh, a, a rational function of you. Well, you can see that the whole thing is Pontryagin's maximum principle reinvented. Uh, so we just have to reach back to um, Pontryagin's book and say that what we really need to do is to minimize the total intake over all feasible U, um, so we want to minimize some, some function of X and U dt. Uh, now, I'm specifying this in general. In practice, G will be just U. Um, but I thought, well, we may as well derive the algorithm um, using a general function there, because we, are, we have been altering uh, this function a lot in work that's currently going on. So the mathematical question is, if we have this equation and we want to minimize this functional J of U, and we have two boundary conditions, at the initial fetal weight and the final fetal weight. So it's a two-point dynamical system, uh, so uh, it's therefore a little bit novel as far as the mathematics is concerned. When you do the usual thing, uh, you take a calculus of variations, Bruce, in a sense, of uh, vary, vary, varying the U with a small parameter, a small perturbation, and call that the state corresponding to this control, which satisfies this. And again, I uh, got got those two point boundary conditions. It's a non-holonomic Yes, yes. Uh, no, not really. Oh, oh, it's it's yes, yes, it's Pontryagin. That, this is a the Lagrange function. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, that that's an identity, and so we just uh, it, ask ourselves what what what. Whoops, I should go back. Uh, what lambda are you going to put in? So you're doing exactly the magic hat of Pontryagin. Um, that's that's an identity. Uh, so you write that there, uh, adding the zero expression to our equation. So here's the here's the answer to your question, uh, Bruce. Is that we're going to amend the functional by this, so we are forming the right functional now. I, 
it always seems magic to me that it works so well. Uh, and then you take the variation, um, differentiating the spectrum of silence. Sorry, I typed these equations in Word and um, it, it squeezed it up a bit. Oh, sorry. Um, it squeezed it up a bit. So you're differentiating with respect to epsilon and then setting epsilon equals naught, uh, you get the n value is constant and so uh, that's the thing you want to satisfy and you can see in fact that uh, you've got, you can choose the lambda to satisfy the usual equation. Uh, if you re rearrange it and follow yourself through, uh, du by d epsilon is h of t, you end up with uh, the touching the wrong one. You, e you end up the, with the adjoint equation, you choose, you choose the coefficient of, it's on the last slide, sorry, uh, you, you've got the h, h uh, multiplying everything, lost myself there, keep, uh, keep using the wrong one, and you get the adjoint equation for lambda dot. So that's the equivalent of the Lagrange multiplier, you've got that function. So we call that the adjoint equation, and uh, that's it there. The optimality condition is that. So you're going to have three equations, two boundary conditions on x, none on u, and um, the lambda can be eliminated if you like, because you can solve, use this equation here to solve for the lambda and get rid of it. So you're going to end up with two equations, um, but the boundary conditions are all on one of them, which is rather unusual for a dynamical systems person like myself. So you're trying to solve for x and u? Yes. The lambda you don't really want, so you use this equation to eliminate the lambda. Yeah. Once you get um, another variable, you can't do this. It rather, rather surprised me. All the um, packages for control theory actually just solve the whole lot together. But I just thought it would be quite fun, since it's you that we want to eliminate the lambda. So that's what we did. Uh, we ha have initially, of course, three coupled equations. Uh, that one's the original one, two points on that. That's the original Gross Dynamics. We've got the adjoint equation and the optimality condition. And the optimality condition, you can put the lam lambda uh, there and then differentiate and put lambda dot there and so you're going to get a single equation for u and that's the unusual bit I suppose and there it is there and that's the actual equation for u with no, no you've got no boundary conditions on that particular equation uh, but you've got two on the other so there's a the question of existence to discuss I won't have time to get into that um, and you can check that the Hamiltonian G plus lambda F uh, is minimized. We did, that works for the kind of problem that we had. The, the interesting case that the biologists were always giving us initially, they don't now, uh, functions they were autonomous, we were let drop the T there, that were separable. And so that was quite an interesting little outcome because that meant that um, if you go back to the equation here, if, you, if, if f is separable, then the numerator of that equation there is in fact zero, which is quite interesting. And so the optimal condition for very simple functions is the feeding rate has to be constant. Okay. U dot is naught. Uh, so we ha this is not the actual case because in fact uh, this, this is, isn't satisfied exactly but for the purposes of exposition today uh, did, did that. And so you just then need to um, put u as a constant back in the logistic and find the <coughs> value of it that makes the birth weight be what you want. Uh, and so therefore uh, in the, in the equation, dx by dt, r, there's the Michaelis meet, and that's multiplication now, the way r depends on that, r is a constant, u over u plus l, is the best information we can get. And so the problem is now elementary for this particular case, because all you need to do is to find the value of u that gives this achieved birth weight. Okay.
how we're going. Now, uh, what we've had to do recently is admit, and I haven't got it on the slide, the actual thing that fits best is dx by dt is r u over u plus l into 1 minus k, uh, sorry, x over k, but the k is not constant, it's got a constant bit, but uh, there's a, a dependence on uh, u and the history of u, so I'll just call it y, uh, where uh, y is equal to the uh, integral up to present time. So the model that is finally going to be used towards the end of the contract is actually that. And of course that means that you have an ancillary equation, y dot equals u. And uh, so then you have to have another lambda, as Pontry Argon would suggest. But I won't show you that now, because I know time is quite short. Um, for our particular problem, I'll just stick to a constant k, uh, r u over u plus l into x into 1 minus x. And then using the uh, information from the biology, we had r is about 0.07 days. L was, came out to be about that. That was by fitting with the nutrition data against the weight of the sheep and the weight of the lambs and a, a mythical uh, carrying capacity of seven. And so it turns out that um, what the animal has to achieve, do to achieve that with a birth weight of 5.5 kilograms, say, uh, has to eat just over two kilograms per day of grass. Um, and that will, achieve, that will do everything, uh, that's the minimum value uh, of the intake for the day, uh, for the 72 days. All right. And it's a pretty uninteresting graph. But that's what you want. And over the 72 days of the second half of the pregnancy, the sheep would actually consume 145, 146 kilograms. How am I going for time? All right. Yep. And that, that, that's the fit again. It's pretty good. Um, and then you can do scenario modeling at will. Uh, much of the data for cohorts of sheep, or all, all these guys live in Palms North there, if you take the same intake over 145 days, the so, so, same, same intake over 145 days, but you feed it at different rates, um, you, you can compare what happens for that. We did also lots of other scenario, uh, this, this is the sort of thing the animal sci scientists rate, uh, with the three different feeding rates, of kilograms per day, the birth weight isn't affected that much, you, uh, you get 5.482, which is just under 4.5. So it wasn't very sensitive, that algorithm, this particular form. Uh, if you take low feeding in the last third of the half pregnancy, uh, you get the same area and, and it gives you a birth weight a bit smaller of 5.47. So it wasn't particularly sensitive which of course made us question the model. The idea is right, but it wasn't particularly sensitive to the see it's, it's not far off 5.5 kilograms. And uh, there's those three different scenarios, scenarios superimposed, all have the same area under them, and uh, you can compare the birth weights. Uh, there's the, the, the black one is the optimal, but it's not significantly bigger. You have to blow it up to see the difference. But the idea is there. So what we were able to say at the, towards the end of last year, that we had a, quite a powerful algorithm, and it can be easily generalized to other growth functions, in view of the fact that it was um, not producing much variation, and not as much variation as is seen in practice to the outcome, uh, we've had to modify the equations, and that is in fact the version that we're now using uh, for the second stage of the contract. I thought it was a considerable mathematical in interest, actually, that here we have um, an algorithm that is hardly used in the biological literature from Pontry Argon, and uh, there's some quite important theoretical questions remain, that, such as existence of an optimal, uh, because after all, you can't guarantee that because you've got a two-point boundary value problem. I've been stressing to the people in Palmerston North that we need a lot more data and we're certainly getting it and we had a major uh, find the other day 
that we found that there is a considerable amount of human data uh, from a study of um, people in South Auckland uh, of a Polynesian extraction where the birth weights can be up to about five kilograms. They are big babies. Yeah. Um, and so we'll be actually fitting this model to human data in the second half of this year. What are we doing with this? Well, of course, it's a contract to our centre. Uh, we've got uh, to, to deliver on that, uh, but in particular, we've also got to make sure Shana Khan finishes a PhD by October. So that's, she's busy working on that right at the moment, because she has to then return to Bangkok. Oh, yes, I, I, I managed to get of this contract some master's fee scholarship, so anyone who wants to come, uh, there's at least money to pay some fees. And that's the story of this. Medicine is a really good area for mathematicians to get into, and um, I've been pleasantly surprised that it's relatively easy to get research money from. So I think the combination of maths and medicine should be pursued. Thank you. Yeah, there was first question.